Good morning. Hope you'll work with me this morning. I'm feeling kind of nervous right now. A few minutes ago, my wife Linda was looking at me like this and had her hand like this, and she was saying something to Mackenzie. I don't know what it was, but I'm a little anxious about that, I have to tell you. This evening, we have the High Point Youth Group at 6 p.m. here at the church. Staff, this is a staff meeting week. Just want to let that get out there. Wednesday night, we have our Bible study and brew. We'd love to have people come join us at that. It's, it's a great group, and it's fun, and it's, uh, we're even reading the Bible sometimes. And then on that, this Thursday morning at 10 a.m., we have the Seekers and Searchers Bible study as well in the fellowship hall downstairs. Phil, would you start making your way forward for us, please? And then, uh, I, are you going to talk about our new guests? All right, I'll let you have the honors on that one then. For those of you who don't know, I make up the bus assistant schedule, and I'm about to make up a new schedule, and anyone willing to assist with the bus, it's a really easy job. You just have to run the lift so that Alvin can ride with the person who needs the lift. Um, please just get in touch with me. My email address is in the, uh, the church phone book type thing. And I plan to make it up today or tomorrow. So please get in touch with me if you're willing. And if you have a particular day you'd like to do it, please let me know that also. Thank you. Do you want to go ahead? Good morning. This is a minute for mission. This week, Operation Heart, our ministry to help resettle Afghans, will welcome two families to Terre Haute. And if there's one thing I've learned, it's to expect the unexpected. We were surprised when the first six men who arrived, when the first six single men who arrived, turned out not to be single, but just traveling alone. They have families and wives that they left behind in Afghanistan. We didn't expect that we would have to keep a lid on publicity about this effort. We can't go to the general public and tell them what's happening because of concerns about the safety and security of, of our uh, resettlement clients. Islamophobia has been a problem in other communities and we don't want to risk their safety. Instead, we've had to spread the word through our friends and family and through our churches. We were not surprised by the generous support that you all have provided to help resettle these folks. Through donations of furniture and clothing, food, volunteer hours, and especially your financial gifts. Again, we were surprised when all six of our men decided to leave Terre Haute recently. They have moved to Texas, California, Wisconsin. This week, more will move to New York and California. We were disappointed and confused by that. We thought we've done a lot of good things to welcome them here. Why don't they want to stay? But as we learned about the process, we understand that we have given them a firm foundation, and now they're moving on to other communities to start the next chapter in their new American life, cities where they happen to have friends and family that they already know and will have a strong support network with. We know that having families and children will present new dynamics. There will be joys, there will be problems, there will be challenges, and many rewards. But with your help, with your continued support, we know we can do it. It may be that we continue to see Afghan refugees cycle through Terre Haute in their first stop in America. And perhaps later this summer, we'll be welcoming Ukrainian refugees instead. We'll be prepared for that, and we thank you for your help. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, it's five adults and seven minors this time around in two households. So let's pray for their safe travel and getting them here into town. All right. Um, we're a bit of an update on the teacher from Meadows, Mindy Landon. She's doing better. She's in a rehab facility now after another surgery. 
things are looking up. And also for Gail Hayes, for whom we've been praying, her tumor is, quote, all but gone, and the inflammation is way down. So that's a really positive report to be able to share. Thank God for that. Speaking of Afghans, this, earlier this past week, William Saw managed to extract 54 Afghans from uh, Pakistan to Brazil, where they have a two-year residency visa. He's got 20-some more of these still trying to get out of Afghanistan, but it's getting harder and harder as the Taliban have decided, apparently, it's a regional thing. It varies from place to place within Afghanistan, but in some places, the Taliban see this as a revenue source. So they're glad to, to let people go after you've paid the proper bribes. In other places, they're just not letting it happen anymore. And that includes Kabul, where most of the remaining folks are that William is working for. Uh, I think he's accomplished a miracle. I really do. And uh, if you've been on the mailing list, you will know more about why I say that. But uh, anyway, let's, let's just praise God and thank him and ask God to continue to support William as he expends an incredible amount of energy and raises money and does all the rest he's doing for these people who were working for him when he still had that business going in Afghanistan. Having said those things, it's time now to turn our hearts and minds to worship Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Let us be called to worship. O come, let us sing to the Lord, and shout with joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into God's presence with thanksgiving, singing joyful songs of praise. Let us worship our Savior, Jesus Christ. Our hope secure, hallelujah. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Invite the children to come forward for the children's lesson. Thank you. Hi, friends. Where are you going to sit today? You want to sit right here? Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Glad you're all here. Who are we missing? Hi, Mont. Is Ella here? Are you coming up? Maybe in a minute? Okay. All right. So, you know, every Sunday when we get to come to church, I hope you feel like that that's a special day. But today is even a little bit more special. Well, 
we had a really special Sunday last Sunday, so I don't know, maybe it's hard to compare, but today is special at church here too because it is Prayer Partner Sunday. Sorry, I didn't mean to hit you in the head. It's Prayer Partner Sunday. Hmm, do you guys know that? Did you even know that was happening? Maybe a little bit? Yeah? Okay, good. So, once you get into kindergarten in our church, is there anybody here who's going into kindergarten next year? Hmm? Yeah, maybe. So once you get into kindergarten in our church, maybe one other, maybe one other little person here that's going to kindergarten next year, you get to partner up with a special adult who becomes your prayer partner. And in addition to your family and your friends and all of the, the people you have in your life who love you and pray for you, this becomes a person that you can connect with and pray with and think about as part of your special church family. So after worship today, we're going to look for the orange tables downstairs, and we're just going to have some time to do an activity together with our prayer partners um, and spend some time together. So I hope that'll be fun. In addition, today, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about prayer. But first, I brought this with me. Does anybody know what this is? A magazine. A magazine. I was going to bring a newspaper, but I couldn't find one. I don't take the newspaper. Isn't that terrible? I should have asked somebody to bring one. But this is a magazine. So you can think about a newspaper or a magazine. What can you find inside of something like this? Information, Information yes. Stories, right? Yes. And when I was in college, I took a few journalism classes. I didn't end up doing that for what I studied all the time, but I took a few classes in journalism, and I learned about writing stories, whether it was in a newspaper or a magazine. There were five important things that I learned that you have to talk about usually when you write a story. They all start with the letter W. Does anybody have a guess of what one of them might be when you're writing a story? Hmm. I'll give you a hint. The first one is who? What? 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 When? when? Where? 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 And why? Yes. So there's five W's that you want to think about when you're writing a story. Now, there's another book that we think about a lot, and especially when we're, when we're here at church or when we're doing Sunday school and things like that, it, start, it starts with a B. Anybody know what that is? The Bible, right? And the Bible is also full of stories. And a lot of those stories tell us the who, the what, the when, the where, and the why. Did you also know that when you are praying, you can think about that? And you can, you can think about the five W's when you think about saying your prayers. So when we think about the first one, who do you guys think should pray? Hmm. Everybody. Good job, Annie. Yes. What do you think is something that you can pray about? Hmm. Does it have to be something specific? Does it have to be about church? Jesus, Jesus sure. But praying can be about anything. It can be about anything you want it to be about, right? Anything that, that is on your mind or anybody who's on your mind or anybody who's special to you or might need some extra love. So when? The next one is when. When can you pray? Can you only pray when you're here in this building? No. When's some other times that maybe you pray? Anytime. Bedtime. Right? At bedtime or before you eat. But also, I love Cora's answer of anytime. It could be any time that you want to. Before you, eat dinner. before you eat dinner sometimes. Yeah. So what about the where? That's the fourth one. Where should you pray? Anywhere, anywhere you want to, right? It doesn't have, sometimes it is at the table. We say a blessing before we eat or before bed, and that's wonderful. But maybe you'll be in the car. Maybe you'll be ready, getting ready to do something hard at school. Or before you get dressed in the morning. That's a great time to pray, absolutely. So the last one is why. Why do we pray? Hmm. To help us with our problems, right? We pray so that we can talk to God. We pray because we know that God is there for us and he answers our prayers. And we can think about others and our prayer partners and our families who are also praying and praying with us and for us. Definitely. Definitely. All right. So thinking about all of those things as you're praying and remembering the five W's, who what, when, where, and why. Maybe as you say your prayers this week. So will you bow your heads with me? Gracious God, we thank you 
for hearing our prayers. We thank you for answering our prayers. Help us to remember that you are always there for us, as are so many who love us in our lives and in our church. You're there when we feel sick, when we feel well, maybe when we're feeling troubled. We remember that you always forgive us when we make mistakes and that you rejoice with us when we are happy. Be with us in the rest of our day today and in our week ahead and in all of our prayers. In your name, amen. All right. Um, hang on, Tess. Okay. Jesus loves me. Please join me in prayer. Lord God, teach us by your word, we humbly pray, that we might come to a deeper understanding of your ways. Help us to conform our heads and hearts to your desires. Lead us in those paths which you have ordained. Use your church to make peace, lift up truth, and spread love in your world. In your holy name we pray. Amen. The first scripture reading is from Psalm 118. There are glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has punished me severely, but he did not give me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I might enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you. Give us success.
we turn to the book of Acts for our New Testament lesson today, chapter 5, and we're going to start in the middle of a conversation. This is between Peter and the temple officials who are not pleased with him. Acts 5, 27, listen now for the word of God. <clears throat> when they had brought them, they had them stand before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, we gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you were determined to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior, that he might give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Nelson Mandela appreciated the irony. Threatened with imprisonment and having already gone to prison four times against orders in 1961, he traveled secretly around South Africa, meeting undercover with reporters and also with leaders of Spear of the Nation, a guerrilla group that used violence to pursue political ends. Mandela disguised himself as a chauffeur, driving a white man, who happened to be an old neighbor and friend from a posh suburb of Johannesburg, because actually Nelson Mandela came from a rich family. He was actually of tribal royal blood. Now here he was playing the black underling, going around to plan strikes and bombings and all sorts of civil unrest. After making his grand tour without incident, without getting arrested, he went to serve as a delegate to a Pan-African conference in Egypt. Upon his return to South Africa, the police arrested him at the airport. In 1996, a former diplomat named Donald Rickard revealed that the CIA had used his embassy as a staging point to plan and execute that arrest. Mandela would spend the next 28 years in various prisons, including the notorious Robben Island. <coughs> Excuse me. During those long years, Mandela rethought his earlier advocacy for the use of violence as a tool to force change. Whereas before he had studied Marx and Lenin and Chairman Mao and trained in covert tactics, now, he reverted to an even earlier appreciation that he had had for Gandhi and Jesus. He responded positively to overtures from Archbishop Desmond Tutu, a staunch advocate for nonviolent tactics. Mandela, while in prison, wrote letters advocating nonviolence to the public. His lawyers smuggled them out behind false bottoms in the crowns of their hats. Throughout his long public career, Mandela always spoke out, disregarding the consequences. By the time of his release in 1990, he had his word converted to the path of peaceful protest, and he was world famous. His departure from prison was broadcast around the world, this time riding in the back of an open car. He and his wife waved to the crowds, thronging the path along the way to the city hall in Cape Town where he gave a speech that included this quote, the brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. The apostle Peter had also already served time when he challenged the high priests and the council with what we just read. The high priest snarls back, we strictly charged you not to teach in this name Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching 
and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Let's unpack that. The we refers to the Sadducees, which was a religious party who under the Herods became the party of priests responsible for running the temple and its worship services. The Sadducees did not believe in resurrection. They found no support for the concept in the Old Testament law, and having been deeply affected by the Greek school of the Stoics, they denied that our souls live on after we die to this world. Jeffrey Bromiley, the author of the Theological Di Dictionary of the New Testament, writes, quote, in the Sadducees' view, the present world is the place of the one encounter with God and the related reward and punishment, end quote. For the Sadducees, Peter's first and greatest offense is claiming that Jesus of Nazareth came back from the dead. His second offense was implicating the Sadducees for Jesus' death on the cross. They feel he deserved it. They feel no guilt whatsoever. They and their rivals, the Pharisees, just did what had to be done, don't you know? Just a week before, the whole city had gone out to watch this rube from Galilee as he rode into town on an ass. People were speculating that he might be the Messiah. Can you believe it? Day after day, he taught radical interpretations of the law and the prophets in their precious temple. Somebody had to take him down, and they did it. Now here come this ragtag band of his followers with their twangy Galilean accents claiming he has risen from his grave. The Sadducees had hoped that killing him would put an end to this stuff. The Herods hoped the same, as did the Roman governor. But these people just will not shut up. Peter knows that what he's saying will get him in serious trouble, and he says it anyway. He has to do God's will, he says, not theirs. He doubles down on both of his prior claims that the Sadducees share the blame for Jesus' death on the cross and that he subsequently rose from the dead. He says, quote, the God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Another shot across the Sadducees' bow. This point is sure to irritate them because they run the temple. They administer its primary function, performing sacrifices on the high altar for the forgiveness of sins. They administer... They're in charge of forgiveness. God's law told them how to make it happen. It's all back there in Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. The Spirit of the Lord had caused that, all of that to be written, and they're just doing what God told them to do. That's the old, I was just following orders defense. But Peter has even more to say. Quote, and we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him, end quote. The Holy Spirit and the Spirit of the Lord are one and the same. Peter is claiming the very authority that Sadducees understand to have given them their duties and their power. He says it has given him a new revelation. And that revelation unseats the Sadducees, making them irrelevant to the process of repentance and forgiveness. No wonder the next verse in Acts chapter 5 reads, when they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. Peter knows all of this will happen before he opens his mouth the first time. Yet he speaks. Nelson Mandela did the same. Mumsnet, M-U-M-S-N-E-T, Mumsnet. Mum is the British slang for mom. Mumsnet is a website by parents for parents. 
I read a post there this week which came from a, a person who shared that her parents had abused her repeatedly during her childhood. Nothing sexual or physical, she said, but abuse all the same. She had gone to a therapist about it, finally, and after a number of sessions, began to feel the need to speak to her parents about it. The thought of confronting them terrified her, but she felt she could never fully heal emotionally if she didn't do it. She set up a meeting with them without telling them why. They had not seen each other for years, so after the hellos, her father said, why are we here? She replied, so I can tell you, I have finally found the strength to talk to you about how much you hurt me when I was little. Of course, they didn't see it that way. She was the black sheep. It's her fault. Besides, she'd had a perfectly lovely childhood. Now, her therapist had prepared her for this. So she gave them three examples of them belittling her with specific quotes from each of them from her childhood. She recounted excessive punishments, cruel punishments. She reminded them of how they would promise her a reward. A trip to an amusement park was one specific example, only to de deny it to her once she had actually complied with their expectations. In her post, she wrote that she started crying almost as soon as she started speaking to them, all the way through her prepared script. Times come when we must speak. Sometimes we must share bad news. Sometimes we can share good news. But so often, we allow fear to prevent us from saying what must be said. Oh, some of us blurt out anything without thinking about the consequences. One member of this congregation just last weekend smilingly said of herself, I'm a blurter. Others say nothing, ever. They just eat it. Add in the conditioning most of us got when we were children never to speak of politics or religion, and we find that very few of us are willing to speak the good news to a world desperate to hear it. And we, here in this room, can identify two additional reasons we do not often talk in public about Jesus. The first is that whereas many people in our world nowadays intentionally use social media to talk about politics, very few people do about religion. The other reason is, frankly, we're Presbyterians. We just don't do that. That's for the Baptists, not us. The Gallup organization has conducted religion polls annually since the 1950s. And from their data, we, we learn that Presbyterians are the second most educated of any tribe of Christians in our nation, trailing only the Episcopalians. If, as a denomination, we are so bad burned educated, why can we not think up a way to speak up about Jesus Christ and him crucified and him resurrected? It may strike some of us as a bit of a jarring transition to go straight from the Episcopalians to the Hall of Fame football coach, Vince Lombardi, but here we go. One of Lombardi's maxims, maxims was, always run to your strengths. He liked to boast that his teams had run the same play the same way for decades and nobody could stop it. Called simply sweep left or sweep right, he believed it succeeded for two reasons. Number one, they practiced it until they ran it perfectly every time. And number two, they drafted players who would be good at it. So practice and personnel. If the Presbyterian strength is education, 
Why not run that play? Do you know a young family looking for a church? Talk to them about our Sunday school, about our dedicated teachers, many of whom are teachers in the rest of the world. Do you know anybody else who might be interested in our adult classes? We have the, a, an adult Sunday school class. We've got the Wednesday night class. We've got the Thursday morning class. We do a lot of Bible around here. We run our plays pretty well, and we have players formed in the mold to make it happen. If we can learn to speak in an educated way, and yet with humility, and a willingness to listen if somebody else wants to tell us their version of the good news, we have nothing to fear and no reason not to speak up. Jesus himself told his followers that the Holy Spirit would give them the words they needed in the moment they needed them. I don't advocate forcing the question or trapping people into listening to our witness like that couple last week who started singing Christian songs in the center aisle of an airplane. Maybe controversial for a minister of the gospel to say, but I don't think that was appropriate. But I do advocate that we try to allow the Spirit to move us to speak when it is appropriate. Think and pray about what to say, and God will give you what you need to say. Trust that. Peter did, and he helped get off the ground the very movement in which we are still participating right this very moment, the Christian church. What might we accomplish? Smaller, of course, but still important. Speak up. Let us pray. Dear Lord, forgive us, we ask for our silence. Give us the courage to speak and the knowledge of when and how to say things. Help us to witness to your good news. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
We're going to read now a, a common affirmation that comes from the Belhar Declaration, which is also from South Africa and was written in the 1990s by a church conference there. Please join with me. We believe that the church is called to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world, that the church is called blessed because it is a peacemaker, that the church is witness by both word and by deed to the new heaven and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. Please be seated. And let us pray. O oh Lord our God, we come to you in prayers of intercession, asking that you might intervene for those who are in need in their lives and bring healing and hope. Lord Jesus, we pray for prisoners of any kind, whether to addiction or to incarceration. May it be your will that they might do what time they must, but find freedom in the end. We pray, O oh Lord, for people who speak. Give them intelligence, we ask, and, and cohesion in their words, that they might witness to you. Let your love come through what we say, we ask in your name. Lord Jesus, we pray for all churches of all denominations, and of whatever persuasion and theology. Let their mission be full and their work effective as they lift high the cross. We pray for their pastors, their elders, their deacons, their teachers. We thank you, Lord, that we are part of your body and ask that it might grow in strength and in number, that it would be your will that near and far the word about Jesus will get out. We pray, O oh Lord our God, for those who are sick in mind, body, or spirit. We pray for those who take care of them, who tend to them, who counsel them. We pray, O oh Lord, for those who are lonely, for those who are stuck at home. We pray for the angry. Give them peace in their hearts. We pray for the frustrated. Give them patience, we ask. Lord Jesus Christ, we pray for each other in our congregation, in our families. We thank you for prayer itself. We thank you for the children who already know how to pray and can answer the leader's questions so well. Move us all, we ask, by the power of your spirit to remember you and to pray more often and with more power and let that power come from you and work through us. Even as Jesus Christ had taught us and in his name now we come together in one voice to give back to you the prayer which he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would the ushers please receive the offering?
Lord, we pray that you would take these offerings from us and use them to further the workings of your will through this congregation and beyond it. We praise you and thank you for your offering of yourself to us and give back to you as a token of our regard and esteem for you. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.